Hey guys, this is John with Games381.com. I'm here back with Joe Cody, he's the owner of Atari2600.com, and this is episode two of Talking Retro with Joe. How you doing, Joe? Great, thanks for coming over. Absolutely. So you got some more goodies in front of us. Tell us what you have. I do have some things I wanted to show you today. Um, uh, talking about uh, video game rarities, um, what we usually do is uh, save the best for last, but I thought today what we would do is start off a little differently and um, maybe show you something that's really rare right off uh, at the beginning here. What I have is, it's right here in front of us today, and I'll go ahead and I'll pick these up so we can see them better. Well, um, this is obviously a controller for a ColecoVision system. You have uh, one there and I have another one over here, but uh, if you look closely at them, can, can you, obviously you can see what the difference is. Yeah, the, the wheel right here. Right, this one has a wheel on it, which never made it into the uh, regular production version of the ColecoVision controller. So uh, what this represents is a prototype ColecoVision controller. Hmm. And, um, you know, what's interesting about this was um, Coleco actually showed this version of the controller uh, prior to the release of the system in 1982. And um, there's evidence of that. I, I thought this would be an interesting thing to show. I'll go ahead and hold it up. Um, this is a front cover of a magazine from July of that year. It's called Video Gaming and Computer Illustrated, Gaming Illustrated. Mm -hmm. and, and notice right here at the front, uh, this is the Atari versus Coleco issue, I suppose. And look at the difference on the controllers here. You can see mm -hmm. that they look like the ones that I'm holding in my hand now. So, mm -hmm. and, and uh, represents the uh, pre-release or the prototype version of the ColecoVision system. The blue buttons are wild, and the, the wheel is on the bottom the, there. That's interesting. It is. It is. Yeah. And so obviously uh, they they dropped the uh, wheel uh, prior to the launch, and why that was done would be anybody's guess. But I think a good assumption would be that it was probably done for cost-saving reasons, mm -hmm. or perhaps. Uh, they didn't have the games that utilize this feature right away, and so maybe dropping it and adding it later. Uh, this did show up later on in the Super Action Controller. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the Super Action Controllers with um, a Super Action Baseball utilize this feature. But um, that's an interesting and a very, very uh, rare uh, ColecoVision Whoa. collectible. <laughs> there you go. What, um, how much is something like this worth? Uh, this controller that you have in your hand is um, perhaps unique. In that case, it, uh, it's difficult to set a price, but I would say that a fair market price to a, a, a serious ColecoVision collector would be in the $1,000 wow. price range. Cool. Really exciting and, and really unusual item to have here. That's very cool. Thanks for showing that, Joe. Sure. What else do you have? Well, I, I know that you're a fan of the Odyssey 2, and I am as well. Uh, it has a lot to offer collectors. Um, and also, I don't think we've ever gone over some of the better items that are available for the system. And I have something here I wanted to show you. Um, here, I'll go ahead and um, show, let you hold on. This is, is a, a regular cartridge, uh, the game Freedom Fighters for the Odyssey 2. Mm -hmm. And here's a prototype cartridge for the same game. This one um, has the words advanced copy, uh, engineering prototype, not for sale. And you can obviously see the difference in the quality of the labeling. Mm -hmm. This has been an internal uh, item used for uh, testing the video game. But I have something else that makes this even more interesting. Hmm. I'll just go ahead and hold this up right here next to you. This is a prototype instruction manual for the same game. So these two items would have been together, uh, the game for play testing, and, and the manual uh, as an example of what they were proposing to release. But I'll set this down, and there's something more also. It goes even beyond that. Hmm. Uh, take a look inside the instruction manual. Uh, you can flip through the pages here, and, and you can see that at this point in production, uh, they hadn't settled on the final version of the instruction manual. On this page, you can see clearly that um, there's cross-outs, there's lines about additions, or I guess it would be changes to the final version of the manual. Here it says for position only. So clearly this is a very interesting item. The instruction manual that came with it is something that I've never seen before, and really makes this and this together as a set uh, really an exceptional item for an Odyssey mm -hmm. 2 collector. Did you find these together? Uh, you know, it's interesting that this would probably never happen twice, but this came to me uh, separately, and this one came just as a standalone uh, manual. And mm. initially, it just looks like a photocopy, uh, nothing of any significance. It's really not until you dig into the inside and you can see that, okay, this is a work in process, uh, pre release version of the manual. So it's fortunate and unusual to have them both together, and you're right, to have them come from different sources and be able to join them back together like mm -hmm. this. It makes an exceptional um, Odyssey 2 collectible. What's the value of something like this? Well, uh, the, the cartridge alone uh, in the marketplace typically sells for 100 to maybe $120 for the cartridge. I think with the addition of the manual being so rare, I think this together would probably sell for close to about $150. Wow. 
yeah, very cool. it's, it's a very nice item. How do you know a prototype from uh, a non-prototype, I guess, because you can probably easily copy this, right? I mean, I guess it's a wearing and tear. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen others that are exactly the same. Uh, the, that prototype, the Freedom Fighters, is, um, I guess you could say, one of the more common Odyssey 2 prototypes that are around. Mm -hmm. They always look the same. Uh, I think one way that you could tell that it's original is because of the wear on it. Also, the printing type. Uh, that, that the black and white printing on this label was not done with a digital printer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no pixelation. It was done with a type of printing process that would, it, you could still duplicate it today, but it would take quite a bit more effort to make a fake using that printing technique mm -hmm. than a simple um, scan and copy. I think it's important to know your sources of where you're buying things from too. I, I agree. Yeah. This is an item exactly. It really helps to know what you're dealing with and, and the source of it's a good point too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What, what else you have? Well, um, moving away, those are two prototype items that I want to show you, but also there's a, a released game. This is an Atari 2600 video game. It's right here at the front of the table. Mm, I've heard of this, yeah. And um, if you're a collector of Atari 2600 games, wow. I mean, you really uh, can't do better than this. This is a very popular game. I think it just has a dramatic uh, illustration, artwork on the front of the game. Uh, the genre itself being um, kind of a hack and slash or, or a horror type of a title is unusual for the 2600 system. It's a, a rare game, it wasn't produced in large quantities. So as a collectible, it has so many things going with it. It has a movie tie-in. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you keep building and building and building upon the rarity of it. And then uh, furthermore, I just wanted to look at this game on both sides here, and you can see it as well. It would be the condition of it. Um, condition is one of those things that definitely affects the market value. Mm -hmm. Um, this one here has, is nice because it has a nice clean face on it. The top flap is a little bit uh, loose and notice how it doesn't tuck in as well. Mm -hmm. That would be a demerit. Also the box is a little bit um, uh, smushed or, or, or angled to one side, probably being stacked underneath some heavier objects. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the benefits of this is that it has nice square corners, it doesn't have ugly crease lines, there's no handwriting stains or water damage. The contents are just as nice as the outside. I would give this game a condition grade of 8 out of 10, very fine. And mm -hmm. I think that would be a fair game on a scale of 1 to 10. This game came out, what, 83? It was released by Wizard Video Games in 1983. So it came out four years after the movie, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that, but uh, yeah. you're a movie buff, okay. Yeah. Okay, well that's, that's fascinating. So how much is something like this worth? Uh, Halloween in today's marketplace is highly desirable, especially with the box. Um, and it also sells for premium during Halloween. October is a great time if you're really, uh, interested in selling this game, um, and we're coming right up on Halloween this week. But anyway, uh, this condition, this game is about a 325 to perhaps $350 video game. Cool. So it's expensive. And so loose cart, what would someone expect? The game cartridge itself is also rare, also very popular, and the value of that would be closer to $100. Okay. And, um, Wizard Video Games, they also produced uh, Texas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's true. Any they, other games they produced? Uh, no, no, no. They, okay. did the, they did the two movie titles, uh, both similar that they were kind of based on uh, horror genre type movies. Um, kind of cult classics, I guess you could say. That was the end of the production. Too. Is there blood in this game? Like Texas yeah, uh-huh, okay. there is. Uh -huh. yeah. What's the gameplay like? Is it just... It's a plat... I guess you could call it a platformer. It's a multi-screen uh, role-playing game. And it does have... Um, um, is it gratuitous? Given the limitations of the system, it's not. Uh -huh. However, um, if you were to put yourself in 1983, it would stand out from the crowd of other games that are available for the system as far as the actions involved, the slashing, the blood. Yes, it, it is unique. Very and, cool. and of course, very cool. Yes, I agree. Yeah, cool. Well, that's an expensive um, rarity, uh, but you know, uh, one of the nice things about video game collectibles is that you don't always have to spend a lot of money mm -hmm. to get something nice. And by nice also, I mean rare. And, uh, well, I mean, I, they're right here in the front of the table. If we kind of take a look, what I have spread out on the front of the table are some cups. They're plastic cups. And um, what these are are 7-Eleven Slurpee cups from a video game promotional campaign they ran in 1980. Two. So I'm, I believe it would probably be the summer of that year. What there are here is a total of nine different cups, and each cup features a, a popular video game. Uh, here, this one happens to be the Zaxxon Cup. I think you had the Asteroids Cup over there. And um, so these are, would fall into the memorabilia type of a video game collectible. Um, the thing about them, which is interesting, is they're rare. Not a lot of these were saved. Obviously, they were intended to be used and perhaps kept for a short while. It's also nice about this set 
is it's a set of nine different ones. I, I'm not sure how many they produced. Mm -hmm. you, you could perhaps find one or two if you were to seek them out, but to find all nine, all different, and in, and in this type of condition makes it a rarity. The great thing about this is it's not very expensive. Mm -hmm. As far as what you have here, the value of these cups would probably be in the 50 to $75 price range for the set of nine. Huh. Well, one thing I want to point out, these are kind of flimsy, so I'm sure you got to watch out for a couple things. You got to watch out for cracking. They're really flimsy. You can see how thin a material yeah. they used. And you have to watch out for when they put them to the dishwasher, oftentimes they fade and the color fade and these exactly. seem to be pretty good shape. So. I, I, I think that overall, well, I noticed one of them in the front row here, uh, over here had a, a crack in the lip. Okay. You know, uh, yeah. but they're so flimsy. I, I would have to imagine that uh, this would be speculation, but wouldn't it seem that these were put together by the original owner that went every week and got a new cup? I mean, it would be conceivable that somebody could put this collection together one piece at a time, yeah. but because they're all in the same condition, it seems that probably where these came from originally would have been uh, a person that went to 7-Eleven uh, and attempted to buy every single one of the cups, one mm -hmm. Slurpee at a time. And I'm sure most people just do them away. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very cool. Awesome. That's an interesting video game collectible. Yeah. A and um, on the theme of, um, I guess you'd say, interesting and rare video games uh -huh. uh, that you don't have to spend a lot of money for, this would be the, uh, the final item I wanted to show you today. So have you seen one of these before? This. Um, there's a, name, yeah, it's a, it's, there's a name for it. It is. It's a store display. A lot of times people call them standee. Standee, standee yeah. Right. And um, it's a promotional item that was given uh, by the video game companies uh, to the video game stores and retailers to, to promote their upcoming game releases. Obviously, so, this one's for Pitfall. So a place like Sears would maybe have this on display. And, and maybe some of the independent yeah. shops, too. Where they would have it for a short while on their counter, and then they would usually be thrown away. So not many of them survived. This was in excellent condition. That's nice by itself, but this one's a little bit special uh, to me personally because um, notice over here. David Crane. Uh, you recognize the signature yeah, right yeah, away. Yeah. yeah, David Crane, the programmer of uh, uh, Pitfall and, and other classic video games, uh, autographed this for me uh, just this summer. And so in my opinion, it really I mean, greatly enhances the value. And what a great way to display David's uh, 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 autograph, but on this freestanding, three-dimensional display like this. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's really interesting. I mean. Um, and, and here's a way where you can have a lot of fun with your hobby without spending a lot of money. The display itself, the standee uh, as it stands, is it's not cheap, but it's not over the top. It's probably a $50 item yeah. somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, however, with the autograph on it, it's not for sale. This is a personal yeah. item that I'm going to keep <laughs> for myself. I mean, it's nice, and it would be um, something that you wouldn't have an opportunity to reproduce. But again, rare, uh, possibly unique. Uh, it's the only one I've seen with his autograph on it. And... Um, Fits in the category of affordable collectibles. And they still make standees for games today. Yeah, they do. They yeah. should, they, yeah. They're a popular way of advertising. Sometimes they're Jeez. as hard as a, tall as a person. Yeah, and life size and stuff. Very cool. Well, I appreciate your time, Joe. And um, definitely check out Atari 2600 for some of these great items and more great items. Thank you. The link below. Thanks for your time, Joe. See you Look soon. To seeing you again. Yep. Bye. Bye.